thanks everyone uh, for joining. Thanks to all of you watching online. Um, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at the School of National Public Affairs, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy. It's a pleasure to have you all with us here today for this very timely uh, event. Um, as you all know who watch energy markets closely, we've seen uh, a quite remarkable turnaround in the U.S. coal sector, U.S. coal employment, uh, and the outlook for coal. Uh, and that has often, there's a lot of um, discussion and, 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 and rhetoric about exactly what uh, has caused that decline and what the outlook is under different scenarios, including ones that uh, roll back uh, various policy uh, policies that have been put in place over the last couple of years. Um, most recently, the executive order uh, signed by President Trump uh, directing agencies to reverse many environmental rules that were put in place by the Obama administration. Um, and, uh, and, and at that event, with coal miners behind him, uh, said to them, you're going back to work. So that raised the question of exactly what led to the decline of coal, what the factors were that contributed to it, and then what the prospects are for coal moving forward under different scenarios with and without policy, uh, and with different outlooks for um, for the for prices of other energy sources that, that coal competes with. And that was the effort that uh, we worked with uh, Trevor and Peter at, uh, at Rhodium to put together uh, and try to answer that question. So what uh, that was a paper that we released yesterday from the Center on Global Energy Policy, available on our website for those who haven't seen it yet. Um, but we'll summarize it for you here. I'm going to let uh, Trevor do that to start the discussion. Um, and then I'm going to ask for some comments and reactions from uh, Jim Rogers, and then we'll have a panel discussion and take questions from all of you. Uh, so I think people know most of the folks who are up here, but just to introduce them again, Jim Rogers is uh, the former CEO of Duke Energy. He uh, is to our, uh, to, we're lucky that he is on the advisory board of the Center on Global Energy Policy, along with lots of other uh, boards and institutions that he uh, that he helps and, 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 and advises. Started his career as an energy journalist and has been enormously helpful uh, with the new energy journalism program that we've built at Columbia. Uh, Bill Lovelace is in the back here who uh, is leading that for us, sort of energy boot camp for energy journalists. That'll kick off this summer. Uh, and it's been great, uh, Jim, to work with you as we've built the, uh, the Energy Center here at, uh, at Columbia. Professor Jeff Heal, uh, many of you know, a professor of uh, social enterprise at Columbia Business School, member of the Center on Global Energy Policy's Faculty Steering Committee, and has written uh, hundreds of articles, uh, 20 or so books, I think, on all aspects of uh, economic theory and resource and environmental economics. Trevor Hauser uh, is a friend and uh, uh, lucky for me, a frequent collaborator and co-author, uh, partner with the Rhodium Group and leads the firm's energy and natural resources practice, um, had temporary stints in government at the State Department, working as an advisor on international uh, climate negotiations and other environmental issues, and also uh, uh, over the last year or so as an outside advisor to the uh, campaign for Secretary Clinton. And then his colleague, Peter Marsters, is a research analyst at Rhodium who focuses heavily on Chinese environmental and energy issues, which, as we'll hear about, are directly related to the decline of coal, maybe in ways that people don't fully appreciate. So with that, let me ask Trevor to come up, walk people through the findings from the study. Uh, then we'll hear from Jim, and we'll have a conversation. Thanks all for being here. Great. Thanks, Jason. It's uh, great to be back at the center, and uh, great to be in New York, uh, and uh, an honor to be on a panel with, uh, with uh, Jim and Jeff, uh, as well as my uh, colleague Pete Marsters from Rhodium. Uh, this was a great uh, project to collaborate on with uh, the center. It's the uh, third in a series that we've done with CGIP over the past couple of years on changing energy markets from uh, LNG exports to crude exports to uh, changes in the coal market. Um, and, uh, and happy to do it at this, uh, at this particular moment. So I'm just going to walk briefly through some of the headlines of the, uh, the report that was posted online yesterday uh, and kind of set the table for the conversation uh, that, we'll, uh, that we'll have for the rest of the session. Um, so you know, we've seen a pretty dramatic change in 
the coal market over the past four years, five years, and uh, nowhere has that changed more dramatic than in the equity valuation of coal companies. Uh, so as recently as 2011, if you look at the four largest U.S. coal companies combined, uh, so that's Arch, Peabody, Alpha, Cloud Peak, that account for about half of U.S. production, they were valued at a combined $33 billion in 2011. Uh, by 2015, three of the four had gone bankrupt, and their combined market cap was $150 million in what's probably one of the most spectacular market collapses in equity history. Uh, and so the question is, why did that happen? It's had significant implications uh, for uh, different communities across the U.S. in addition to our energy sector. Uh, U.S. coal mining employment, which, as we'll talk about in a little bit, has been on a secular decline for about a century, dropped very rapidly between 2011 and 2016 from 130,000 miners uh, down to uh, 75,000 miners, if you include contractors. Um, at a national level, obviously, that's relatively small, 74,000 uh, employees in a you know, 180 million uh, person labor market, uh, but it's very geographically concentrated. So you know, West Virginia, which has lost 12,500 uh, coal mining jobs over the past four years, uh, that accounts for you know, almost 2% of statewide employment. And then if you look like within West Virginia at certain counties, like Mingo County or McDowell County, uh, where coal mining is like pretty much the only major source of economic activity, uh, the decline has been particularly pronounced. Same in Campbell County and Wyoming, where I grew up, and in parts of the Illinois Basin. Uh, so the impact has been very acute and very localized, not just in employment, but in tax revenue, uh, as a lot of these communities rely on coal mining for a majority of the funding for schools and social services. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is only the most recent installment of a, you know, kind of multi-decadal decline in coal mining employment. So coal mining employment in the U.S. peaked in the 1920s at a little over 800,000. Uh, and by 1970, it was down to a little over 150,000 because of mechanization, just efficiency improvements in coal mining, using machines to dig the rock out of ground instead of people. Uh, and then between 1970 and 2000, uh, coal production increased in the U.S., but employment stayed flat or declined. That was due largely to a shift in production from Appalachia to the Powder River Basin, where they use gigantic pickup trucks with tires twice as tall as I am uh, to move coal and gigantic shovels uh, rather, than, uh, rather than people. Um, but this last uh, five years has, uh, has been particularly dramatic. U.S. coal production is down 33% from 2011 levels, U.S. coal consumption is down, uh, down about 30%. Um, and there's a mix of factors that have driven that decline that we dive into in the report. Uh, on the domestic side, uh, the total size of the energy market, and particularly the power market, has been relatively flat. So U.S. electricity demand has traditionally grown at 1.5%, 2% a year. Uh, that was the average pace from 1949 all the way until 2008. And when utilities were doing their planning, and Jim can talk to this much more authoritatively than I can, you know, up until the past few years, there was an expectation that that was going to continue, that uh, the relationship between economic growth and electricity demand in the U.S. was relatively fixed, and so you could count on kind of 1%, 2% load growth going forward. Obviously, electricity demand fell during the Great Recession, uh, but then it didn't recover when the economy came back. So total electricity consumption in the U.S. is about at the same level it was in 2007, even though the economy is 20 percent larger. Last year, uh, electricity demand fell by 1.2 percent, even though the economy grew by 1.8 percent. And that's due to a range of factors, LED lighting, improved appliance efficiency, utility-driven energy efficiency programs. Uh, but uh, it has significant implications for fuel suppliers because the total market size has been relatively fixed, which means that coal has had to compete for a stagnant market with other sources of energy supply. If you look at where coal consumption was in 2016, relative to where we thought it would be a decade ago, about 26% of the decline is due to this slower than expected electricity demand. And the rest is due to fuel substitution, uh, largely switched from coal to natural gas. So this is power generation by fuel. Coal has averaged about half of power generation in, in the US. Uh, in the post-war period. Uh, last year, it was down to 30% of U.S. power generation. Natural gas was up to 34% of U.S. power generation. That shift from coal to gas accounts for about 40%, 49% uh, of the decline uh, in our analysis. And then rapid growth in renewable energy accounts for about 18% because it's starting from, uh, uh, from a lower base. 
Uh, environmental regulations have played a role as well. There's been a suite of environmental regulations adopted over the past eight years uh, aimed at addressing everything from mercury pollution that, uh, that you know, stunts brain activity in children to particulate matter that leads to asthma. Um, those regulations, though they have uh, social benefit and health benefits, they also impose costs. Uh, when we try to estimate the impact of that suite of regulations on U.S. coal consumption, we do two different things. We start by looking at what the EPA's own estimates are, and that adds up to about a 3.5% decline in U.S. coal consumption. Uh, and then as a kind of check on that, we looked at all coal plant retirements that have occurred uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, between 2011 and 2015, uh, and, and as an upper bound, analyze the amount of coal that those plants would have generated had they stayed online in 2016, and that's about a 3.9% decline. So that gives us a kind of 35 to 4% estimate of the range of, uh, uh, of the impact of EPA regulations on, uh, on U.S. coal consumption. So it's played a role, but it's been uh, a secondary factor to uh, low-cost natural gas and lower electricity demand. The international story, though, is even more interesting. I mean, we've been, you know, for those of you who, like, live and breathe energy markets, we've been in this debate about, like, was it cheap gas? Is it renewables? Is it environmental regulation for a long time? Uh, it turns out that changes in the international market have played um, an even larger factor in the decline in U.S. coal company valuation and a meaningful factor in the decline in U.S. coal employment uh, and uh, in production. Um, so, you know, as everybody knows, 2002, 2011, 2012 was this boom period in Chinese coal demand growth, uh, nearly tripled over that period of time. While China produces a lot of coal domestically, Chinese production was unable to keep pace with Chinese demand, and so China became a net coal importer, which pushed up prices around the world. Uh, we don't normally think of coal as being a global market, but it increasingly is so. So if Chinese coal consumption is increasing prices in Asia, that feeds all the way through to producers in Appalachia who suddenly can export to Europe or can export to Latin America because the price of coal is higher, not just for steam coal, but also for the metallurgical coal used, uh, uh, used in steel making. Uh, in 2011, Asian coal prices were at historical highs, and U.S. coal companies made multi-billion dollar bets on that growth continuing for decades. So they bought large mining assets in Australia. They were planning export terminals on the West Coast to send coal from the Powder River Basin to Asia. And that debt finance was a major contributor to their future bankruptcies when that Asian coal demand suddenly evaporated. Um, we uh, have seen uh, absolute decline in Chinese coal consumption over the past three years after more than a decade of rapid growth. That's due both to a slowdown in Chinese economic activity, which you can see here. Total Chinese growth has fallen from you know 10.5% that it averaged between 2002 to 2012 down to 6.9% in 2015. But even more important has been a change in the structure of the Chinese economy away from the energy intensive infrastructure investment that defined the boom years to more service sector activity. So industry in China accounts for 65, 70% of all energy consumption and even more than that in terms of coal consumption. So the fact that industrial activity has fallen from an 11% annual growth average to 1% annual growth average while service sector activity has continued to grow has reduced the energy intensity of the Chinese economy as a whole and led to, uh, led to that decline. Uh, there's also been growth in uh, non-fossil sources of power generation in China, whether it's nuclear or renewable, uh, and total coal-fired power generation continues uh, to fall uh, as a result. So you add up those changes in international activity, uh, and they have been responsible for 51% of the decline in U.S. producer revenue since 2011. Right? So more than half of the decline in coal company revenue is due to factors outside of the US, uh, US entirely, uh, because we are integrated in this global market. So that's one of the more interesting findings uh, in, uh, in the study. Um, so what's the outlook going forward? Uh, we uh, looked at the potential impact of the new administration's effort to roll back regulations put in place by the Obama administration. On March 28th, uh, President Trump signed an executive order instructing the Environmental Protection Agency to review, suspend, or rescind a range of uh, regulations directed the Department of Interior to lift a moratorium on coal leasing 
in, on federal lands, particularly in the Powder River Basin, uh, and a number of other uh, regulations were targeted. Uh, it's unclear exactly how that will play out. It, you know, it's instructing agencies to go through rulemaking. Those rulemakings will be challenged. Uh, but you know, as a scenario exercise, we modeled the impact of fully repealing all of the regulations targeted in that March 28th executive order to see what their impact on coal markets would be, both at currently projected energy prices and at alternative prices for natural gas and re renewable energy. Um, so the two lines you see, the blue one is at currently projected energy prices by the EIA, which is gradually increasing natural gas prices, you know, modest declines in renewable energy costs, uh, r rolling back all Obama administration policies called out in the executive order would slow the pace of decline in U.S. coal consumption, would keep it flat, roughly flat, at just under 800 million tons. Um, but that's still lower than anything the U.S. has seen pre-2015 for several decades. Uh, so it wouldn't be a recovery, but it would be a, uh, uh, but it would be a kind of plateau in U.S. production. Um, but if natural gas prices stay at the current 3 to $4, if renewable energy prices continue to decline at rates we've seen in recent years, then U.S. coal production falls to 600 million tons uh, and, uh, and employment uh, along, uh, alongside it. Uh, on the international side, we see relatively little prospect for, uh, for the level of growth that would be required to provide export opportunities for U.S. firms or to really prop up Asian prices. Uh, Chinese coal, uh, Chinese uh, economic growth has con continued to decline. The question is whether it's a soft landing, a hard landing, or a financial crisis. Uh, every year that Chinese leadership delays economic reforms, the odds of a hard landing or a financial crisis grow. In any of those scenarios, Chinese coal consumption is significantly lower uh, than it was in years past. Um, even the Chinese government is now projecting flat uh, uh, coal consumption uh, going forward as are uh, the IEA and the International Energy uh, the IA and the EIA, and uh, we think there's downside risk to those forecasts that, if anything, Chinese coal consumption will come in lower. Uh, coal consumption is growing in other parts of the world, in India, where uh, economic growth is now faster than China for the first time in a long time, uh, and where folks at the IMF and other macro forecasters uh, expect that kind of rapid growth to continue, in part because of the Modi administration's kind of successful co consolidation of, uh, uh, of uh, political power. But because of the structure of the Indian economy and the base from which it's starting, even pretty rapid Indian growth is not going to deliver nearly as much coal consumption uh, as we've seen from China. So you know, between 2007 and 2012, uh, Chinese coal demand grew by 1.2 billion tons over a five-year period. Uh, the IEA currently expects over the next five years, Indian coal consumption to grow by you know, 200 million tons. Even if the Indian economy like, suddenly looked like the Chinese economy, uh, as energy intensive as Chinese growth has been, it'd only be you know, 650 million tons. Um, so you know, growth in absolute terms, but that's very different than the level of growth required to make exports from the US economic uh, and to lead to a meaningful rebound in US production. So the outlook for employment uh, in the kind of range of international and domestic scenarios we look at is, in the best case, coal mining employment, including um, contractors growing to 90,000 a year from the current 74,000 a year. That would require natural gas prices being considerably higher than they are today and renewable cost declines being considerably lower. Uh, and in the worst case, coal mining employment down to 60,000 uh, over, uh, over the next five years. Um, so it's, you know, these are, Hard cut. I previewed results from the study in uh, Southeast Wyoming uh, last Friday, uh, and like these are hard conversations for coal communities to have. Um, you know, it's hard to go from a uh, an industry that has been your bread and butter that you've relied on for you know generations to something new. And coal communities across the country are having a uh, having facing a painful choice right now of is this just one more commodities bust that we're going to recover from in a few years' time? If that's the case, we don't need to change our tax structure. We don't really need to think about a serious economic diversification strategy. We just need to buy our, bide our time, draw down on our rainy day funds, and hope for a return. If coal production is not going to recover, then as policymakers, you've got to do things differently. You have to think of new sources of tax revenue. You have to have a serious strategy for economic diversification, uh, for attracting new industries and new job creation. 
And, uh, you know, and our analysis would suggest that uh, the latter is much more likely to be the case. Um, there's some encouraging examples of economic diversification, whether it's in, you know, Mingo County, West Virginia, or Whitesburg, Kentucky, or, you know, in Gillette. Uh, these things take a while to build up. Uh, they take commitment from policymakers, and they take, you know, faith from folks in the community that um, it's possible to build a future that's more diversified and more resilient. Uh, but there's some pretty impressive young people uh, in these communities that want to be able to stay where they are, you know, want to be able to live where their parents raised them, and uh, want to have a viable uh, future doing that. And so I'm optimistic they'll make it work uh, and, uh, and make those uh, communities that are, you know, as vibrant a contributor to our economic future as a country as they've been over the past generation. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Trevor, for that great uh, comprehensive and concise overview of the outputs of the, the research um, and for the discussion at the end that hopefully we'll spend a little bit more time talking about about what it means for these communities in the political discussion and, uh, and dialogue uh, communities that for many decades have uh, have worked often at the expense of their own health uh, to supply the energy that's powered the U.S. economy for a very long time. Um, now facing, as you said, a lot of uh, structural market factors that 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 make the the return to the heyday of coal quite uh, quite unlikely. So uh, we wanted to get a perspective from people who've actually worked in this industry uh, for a while and, and know it uh, from inside about everything that Trevor just said, what's in the paper that we wrote. We couldn't think of anyone better than uh, Jim Rogers, who was the CEO of Duke, the nation's largest utility, a very large consumer of coal. Stepped down as CEO, I guess, right in the middle of the period that is kind of studied and looked at um, by this report, so would have an inside perspective on the impact of the domestic, the international market factors, and also regulation, and wanted to get um, get his perspective uh, on that. And also, I mean, you heard Trevor talk about the importance of the global market growth in emerging areas in terms of what people need to do to expand electricity access. That's something Jim has thought a lot about, including writing a whole book, Lighting the World, on energy access and energy poverty, which I would recommend to people. It's really uh, an insightful look at that question. So I appreciate your spending time with us, Jim, um, and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this study is really important and really informs policy makers, both at the state and federal level, as well as companies, like in the power sector, how to think about going forward. But I should tell you one thing is I, I'm only going to talk for a few moments and comment a little bit on this, but talk about it from the perspective of utility. Unlike Trevor, I talk really slow. <laughs> so you won't hear as many words per minute. You won't hear as many ideas. But I just want to focus on a few. One is the power sector has looked to the coal industry for a very long time. And I grew up in Kentucky, so I know a little bit about the coal industry. When you grow up there, they say there's only three things you can do, coal mine, moonshine, or get on down the line. So I'm in that get on down the line part of the people that grew up there. But coal, as Trevor said, has been more than 50% of the fuel that generates electricity in the United States. It's been the go-to fuel of through the last century. And even if you go back to is the mid-70s, a law was passed in the United States, the Fuel Use Act, that prohibited the burning of natural gas to generate electricity. Then you had Three Mile Island, and then there was no more new nuclear plants built. So you couldn't use gas, you couldn't build nuclear. Renewables weren't available at that point, so the only thing you had to build was coal. So the power sector moved to coal because the demand for electricity was growing. It had not decoupled from GDP yet, so it was still growing pretty dramatically during that period of time. But the industry, in my judgment, is, is looking around the corner, and they recognize that we have to move to a low-carbon world. And actually, without a price on carbon, without any regulation of carbon in the United States, they've already started to change. 
and it's really driven by the affordability of natural gas and the increasing affordability of wind and solar. But really, gas has been the primary driver, as Trevor's study shows. But my belief is, is that they, let me give you just the bottom line. Between 2005 and the end of last year, the industry's reduced its carbon footprint 25%. Duke, where I was, has reduced it 30%. And again, well, that's no regulatory mandate. That's just looking around the corner, know we're in the most capital intensive industry in the world, knowing that we make decisions that last 40 years and we need to make smart decisions. I want to underscore an important point. We look out 40 years. Presidents come, presidents go. Legislatures come, they go. And so my point of view is, is we see a low carbon world as to where we have to go and we're building generation to get there. And so whatever the government is proposing today to reverse field and to go back, we don't plan to do that. And part of the reason is it's driven by the shale gas revolution, it's driven by the low price of gas, it's, it's driven by the how plentiful the gas is in the United States. I mean, I can only imagine when I was a consumer advocate in the 70s, sitting in rooms where we were trying to, we were running out of gas and we were curtailment proceedings trying to allocate where gas goes. So we're really kind of a long way from that today. And I think it's gonna play a critical role. And the, the movement from coal to gas, a couple of important sort of facts. The coal plants are 40 and 50, 60 years old. So it's a really old technology. And we started complying with those plants with uh, the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990, building scrubbers on the back end of the most cost-effective bigger units. So we had a lot of units that hadn't, we still ran them, but they, we ran them in a limited way because we ran the ones that had been retrofitted first. And actually the dynamic that Trevor was describing, I would describe it in a more precise way because I lived it, is that in the 90s, we moved from high sulfur coal with Ab Coal and Central Ab Coal to Illinois Basin Coal and Powder River Basin Coal. For us in the Midwest, we were primarily moving to um, Illinois Basin Coal. And that had a huge impact on the jobs in Appalachia and in Central App. And that started the shift. And then as we built uh, scrubbers on the back end, as additional regs came on NOx and mercury and fine particulate, we built retrofit FCRs, other units, to reduce the output. But ultimately, it, we were left with a lot of fully depreciated coal plants that weren't contributing very much, and we saw an opportunity to make the switch. So I made the decisions going back to the, in seven, eight, nine, and 10, to start building gas plants. And by the way, the other dynamics driving this is the efficiency of gas plants is going up pretty dramatically. If you look at the new GE plants, the new Siemens plants, so there's a really efficient uh, conversion of gas BTUs into electricity. And so that coupled with low gas prices made it pretty easy to make the move. So the industry today is gonna to continue uh, to build more wind and solar. And just as a footnote, 100% of the wind in the United States is either owned by utilities or bought by utilities. 60% of the solar is either owned by utilities or bought by utilities. So they are moving pretty fast into that space and playing a really important economic role in making it happen. But if you look at a snapshot of where electricity came from last year, 33% uh, came from natural gas, 30% from coal, 19% um, from nuclear, and 6% from hydro, and 8% from renewables, wind and solar primarily. So that mix has changed really dramatically. And there are no new coal plants on the drawing board in place in the United States. And one of the reasons, and this gets back to this belief we're going to a low carbon world, is I've spent a decade of my life focused on carbon capture and sequestration for coal plants. It's just not cost effective or economic, it's just not economic to build. 
So the future for coal in the United States, there is no future. And it will be exported to other parts of the world, but it becomes critical to get CCS, particularly in China and India, because 85% of the carbon emission increase between now and 30 is gonna come from these um, developing or low-income countries around the world, not in the US. And so while the industry is moving forward and reducing, and by the way, quick footnote, when I talked about a 25% reduction, the clean power plan is forecast by 2025 of a reduction of about 28%. So in an interesting way, the industry is on track or ahead of track or ahead of plan to reduce the carbon that, the, that President Obama's clean power plan would have called for. So even if that's eliminated, I believe that we'll hit those targets. I'm confident of it. And I think the industry's committed to making that transition. Two other stats I'll leave with you. Two thirds of all new power capacity is wind and solar last year. Uh, and today, one third of the generation in the United States is carbon free. And the probably the most critical part, and we can maybe talk about this, but it's not related, is that 59% of the carbon-free electricity really comes from nuclear. And the big challenge for us to continue to reduce our carbon footprint is whether or not we maintain the, and run those units going forward in the future. And states that are shutting them down, by the way, are going to have a difficult time continuing to hit their targets and reducing carbon in the future. The other last point, and just... And I've kind of haven't done this in an organized way, but politically, coal plants have been shut down in both red states and blue states. More in red states than in blue states, just because there are not many coal plants, for instance, in New York or the Northeast or in California. They're really in the industrial Midwest and in the Southeast. So this is where the plants have been shut down, primarily in red states, and there's been no pushback with the shutdown of those plants. So trying to understand the politics of the energy industry is really important, particularly as you see the industry move forward, uh, moving toward a low-carbon world, and coal will not be part of that future. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Um, so let's uh, have a little bit of a conversation. I want to ask a follow-up question, and then we'll bring Jeff uh, and, and, and Peter in. Just remind um, everyone, like all center events, this is being webcast live. Both the full video and podcast recording will be available online, along with a podcast 30-minute uh, conversation that uh, Trevor and I just had this morning that will be up uh, Monday as the next episode in Columbia Energy Exchange, our weekly podcast that comes out on Monday afternoons. So hopefully you all subscribe through iTunes and Stitcher and your preferred podcast provider. Uh, we'll take questions a little bit uh, into it, too, from the audience. And for those watching online, you can ask questions as well through uh, Twitter at our handle at Columbia U Energy using the hashtag CGEP events. So I just want to clarify something that I think is uh, important because I think it gets confused a little bit about the importance of policy. You know, Jim, we just heard you say this transition is happening anyway, policy is going to swing, industry knows the pendulum will swing, uh, and the, there, there is, you had some pretty strong language that there is not an outlook for coal. I'm skipping through to... Um, Trevor showed a ch uh, the results of the modeling, and, and it doesn't quite show that. It, it, it shows that even if you get rid of a bunch of environmental rules, coal's not coming back. It's not going back to 50% of electricity makes you're not bringing hundreds of thousands of jobs back. Um, but, but it does matter. Coal can stabilize. We're going to be using coal in the electricity mix for a while, and you don't continue to see a decline in coal use. Uh, consistent, uh, certainly with a two-degree target, but but even with the, the regulations that were put in place without policy. And I just want to, like, ask people to comment on that and maybe, Jeff, bring you in on that as well. Um, how, you know, some people say the Clean Power Plan doesn't matter because we're going to get there anyway, or Paris t commitments don't matter because whether we stay in Paris or not, we're going to get there anyway. So if folks could comment on how important policy is uh, and, and, and uh, how, how much policy matters, how binding are these uh, are the targets in these policies? Maybe, Trevor, you want to start, and then Jim and Jeff? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can talk to the models, and then Jim can talk to reality. Um, uh, so, so I think there's, it's, it's important to separate out the role of policy in meeting the Clean Power Plan and the role of policy in meeting 
the U.S.'s Paris targets, right? So the clean power plant just covered the power sector. Power sector is important, but it's only 28, 30 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. The Paris commitment of a 26 to 28 percent reduction below 2005 levels was all sectors and all gases. So that's everything from, you know, methane and agriculture to uh, hydrofluorocarbons to the transport sector. Uh, in fact, transport sector is now a larger source of greenhouse gas emissions than the power sector in the U.S. Just yeah. So I agree with Jim that and our modeling is consistent with this, where if natural gas prices stay at current levels and renewable costs decline as they have been, then the U.S. power sector will exceed the targets of the clean power plan, whether the clean power plan is there or not. Um, if natural gas prices increase, uh, as is currently projected by EIA, if renewables uh, costs don't decline as fast as expected, then the clean power plan would have had a meaningful, not a huge impact, but a meaningful impact on U.S. emissions. And that's, that's the red line. That's sort of the reference case for that's the, the reference EIA, case, which yeah. has gas prices continuing to rise to five and five then six. Five and that's $6. So, you know, it all depends on your view on gas. If you think gas is going to hang out at three to four bucks, then we're going to be at the bottom end of that curve there. And then Jim's point and is going to be And renewables will continue to decline at something close to the pace what they have What they've done been. historically, exactly. Jim, do you want to comment on yeah, my comment wasn't really anti-policy. <laughs> it was actually the recognition of the Paris Agreement. It's actually the recognition that in the long run, the policy of this country is going to drive us to a low-carbon world. And because our industry is so capital-intensive and we build 40-year plants, regardless of what the current political barometer says, we need to be tacking in that direction because we believe that the most compelling policy is a policy that drives us to a low carbon world. So it's our view of where policy will go that really drives us. Because at the end of the day, in the power business, and I learned this pretty quick, over 25 years as a CEO, I learned that we're in the business of implementing public policy. That's kind of an important part of what we do. If it's environmental regulations or environmental policy, we implement it. That's, that's our mission, important part of our mission, given the role that we play in the economy. And so I, I, I'm quick to say that if I'm betting, <laughs> I'm betting the blue curve wins because I look at the amount of natural gas that's being produced. I've, I've watched how when oil prices fell, producers got a lot smarter. They cut costs. They operated more efficiently. They could handle a low-cost oil price scenario, low-cost gas. And so I think, I think we're going to be surprised by that output. But at some point, we have to raise an interesting question. The industry does. How much more gas can we build? And does that block us really go into a much lower CO2 emissions level, because you're locking in 35 and 40 year plants that with a certain emissions profile. So at some point we have to slow down on the gas and as you can see the numbers show, two thirds of all the new power additions are renewables. So that will continue to change. But again, it's all with the recognition that the world and the country is moving to a low carbon future. Yeah, and just so we held, an, the Energy Center held an event on, I think, day one of the Trump administration about the outlook for energy policy under Trump. Jim Connaughton, the former chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Council on Environmental Quality, sorry, um, made the point that uh, that uncertainty kind of can, can also help accelerate, uh, can help uh, this transition because of the point you were making. So just so I understand it correctly, that when in the face of these rapid shifts in policy or uncertainty about what the policy will be, or in four years or eight years, we may see the pendulum swing entirely the other way, um, that these long-term capital investments people in the utility sector make, you think will continue uh, to be targeted toward lower forms, uh, lower cost, uh, lower carbon forms of energy because they see that's the direction it's ultimately headed in. Is that right? Yeah, I'm saying look at the age of the coal plants, and they're almost fully depreciated. Many of them are still 40 and 50 years old. And look at the growth in demand, which is flattish to declining, and I think that continues. And so the only thing you'll be doing is replacing generation as it ages out. And so that, in my judgment, and with the 30 states with renewable portfolio standards and those continue to be built, that puts gas plants and coal plants specifically increasingly on the margin. 
So the vet, so you'll ultimately just shut them down because they're only on the margin and maybe build a little more gas. Mm -hmm. So when you put all those factors together, that's why I'm real bullish about the blue line. You're going to bring me back in about five years and say, Rogers, what were you smoking? <laughs> but, um, but I'm very bullish about that blue line because I know where the industry, how they're thinking. And I look at the economics of wind and solar. I look at the economics of gas. That all drives me to the lower line. And just quickly, the, Trevor mentioned MATS, which was probably the most significant past regulation. When you were head of Duke, sort of how did you view that? What impact do you think that had on the retirements we've seen over the last several years. I mean, as Trevor said, even if you add all those up, that's still a pretty small share of coal's decline. But That's why I went back and mentioned the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990. We looked at our units, and we, didn't, we only put the scrubbers on the ones where it's most economic. So we left a lot of units without uh, any retrofit of scrubbers. It made it easier when MAC came along because we only put the MAC retrofits on the units we put scrubbers on or we had knocks in between and we put SCRs on. If you have a, depending on the grade of coal, if you have a scrubber to SCR on, you take about 95% of the mercury out. So we started selecting the units we were gonna shut down in the 90s. And now we're shutting those down and there's still some that are not retrofitted, depending on how the system's bubbled. And so the, the consequence of that is is that all those old unretrofitted plants will be shut down. What I don't know is how many are left to be shut down. Got it. Jeff, your um, thoughts for, uh, on this question about how binding the policies are, but then just more broadly your reactions to, to the report and the key themes there. So I thought the report was great. It was very interesting. Um, one of the things which surprised me from the report was the role of China. Um, and I, I had not, ant not understood uh, just how important the, the Chinese market was for the U.S. coal prices and U.S. Uh, coal revenues. So I think that's a, that's a very important uh, contribution you've made there. Um, <clears throat> in terms of where coal is going, I actually very much agree with what Jim said. Um, I think we're going to see further reductions in renewable costs, particularly solar. I think there's new solar technologies coming down the line. And if we look you know, 10, 15, 20 years ahead, we'll see significantly lower costs for solar and higher conversion efficiencies. So I think we'll see growth of solar, particularly in the southern part of the US, um, to, to a significant degree. Um, <clears throat> what happens with gas prices is obviously important. It, that it depends to some degree on something we haven't talked about, which is LNG exports. I mean, all of the gas producers are obviously hoping that uh, they can tap foreign markets for US gas, where prices are often quite significantly higher than here in the US. Um, I, I think that we probably will see some growth uh, in U.S. LNG exports, which could justify some increase in demand, so I'll put pressure. So no, I suspect we'll see an increase in supply from fracking as well. And so I don't, don't actually expect net that there'll be much movement in the way of gas prices. Um, so I don't think that uh, coal will be helped a lot by gas prices, maybe a little tiny bit. Something I, you know, I, to me I take away from this discussion and the report is sort of a big irony in all of this, uh, which is that... Um, from an environmental perspective, the decline in coal is a great achievement. I mean, coal is a major source of greenhouse gases and is a major source of health-related pollutants. So it is, it's, a, it's an important environmental achievement. Um, and what is surprising and sort of ironic is just how small the role of policy has been in this. This has been driven largely by market forces and not by the EPA policy measures. Um, and you know, the single biggest contributor to the decline in coal has been uh, the growth of fracking, something to which most environmentalists are, of course, very hostile. Uh, so that's what I see as the, the, the irony here, the fact that this has been driven not by policy measures, but by something to which the environmental movement is generally somewhat hostile. Um, it doesn't mean that policy isn't important. Policy is very important in a number of other areas. And as, as, you were just, as Trevor was just pointing out, um, electricity generation is only a, a fraction of US CO2 emissions. If we want to, for example, tackle emissions from transportation, I think we will need some very strong policies. We'll need you know, tougher cafe standards, <coughs> carbon taxes, and things like that. Um, but uh, I think in the, in, the, in the area of electricity generation, the market has been doing surprisingly well, uh, independently of what's happening in the policy area. And you would agree, I, I, let me ask if you would agree with what Trevor said, which is, you know, so that has been, policy hasn't been that important 
to see what we've seen to date, but if you're serious about the kind of targets people talked about in Paris or two degrees, that doesn't, when the world's not decarbonizing on its own. I've offered, that's my view. Tell me if you agree. Yeah, well, look, I, I mean, Jim mentioned uh, the role of the um, uh, renewable portfolio standards. In fact, we've got 30 states with quite steep renewable portfolio standards. <clears throat> that, of course, has driven the adoption of renewable energy to a significant degree. I mean, I guess Jim could say more about that, but my guess is that's one of the main factors driving renewables early on. Is that right? I think it is the factor. Yeah, right, right, right. So in that sense, there's a role for policy there and a very important one, but that's not federal policy. That's state policy. So the Trump rollbacks are not going to affect that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask questions as well as offer views. So I also think on, you mentioned LNG exports, and I think what we have uh, seen uh, in recent history suggests that um, there is a very large supply of inexpensive natural gas that will allow us to meet the demand for exports uh, without, uh, with relatively cheap, if not two to three, then maybe three to four dollar uh, natural gas. And, and that's going to take some time to play out anyway. So we've just seen the first project go online about a year ago, just had the hundredth cargo of LNG, and I guess over the next three to four years we'll see a few more projects come online. Big question about whether people want to do more than that, given what the global gas market looks like right now. Um, you mentioned, um, uh, Jeff, sort of the, the insights about the global market and how important changes in the Asian market have been to the uh, financial health of U.S. coal firms that, uh, in particular, Pete, is sort of your area of focus is what's happening in the Asian coal market. So I just wanted to um, ask you about that. First, um, um, recently we've seen Asian coal prices kind of rally. So does that, should that make us question the longer-term outlook, and might we actually see some relief for coal uh, from that? Yeah. Um, I think there's kind of a couple stories going on. There's kind of the fundamental underlying trend and then these kind of uh, intervening policy and natural events. One of the uh, most recent events was a hurricane in Australia that uh, cut down supply, prices jumped up again. Um, in China, the as Trevor mentioned, the um, underlying trend is kind of the shift toward from, you know, infrastructure, which requires a lot of cement, glass, steel, which all requires a lot of coal towards more service sector economy. And so that is kind of a fundamental trend that is not changing. Um, China kind of is very similar to the U.S. and their coal communities right now in the sense that they have these very um, concentrated uh, areas where it's, you know, the entire communities are dependent on coal. And Instead of you know 60,000 workers, China has four and a half million uh, workers in the coal sector, and they are looking to lay off about a million workers by 2020, um, and that's very difficult both politically and socially. I mean, you can't do this quickly; you'll get social unrest. There's uh, a lot of consequences to this. Um, so last year, they were starting to run into these troubles where some companies were. Um, failing to pay their workers, having trouble paying off their debts. And so the Chinese government intervened, said the, every coal producer in China is limited uh, by the number of days that they can work, that supply cut increased prices, and as a result, everybody kind of globally that was felt through increased um, uh, import prices. Um, and so kind of these, like, there'll be little changes, little interventions going forward, but overall the fundamental trend is down. So has coal, coal demand has peaked in China? Uh, I think peaked or flatlined, you know, this is kind of the same story. What They won't see the double-digit growth that we've seen over the last, you know, 10 years. Um, it will be either absolute decline or, you know, flatlining going forward. And this is just, you know, China's built the roads, the buildings, the infrastructure it's needed and just won't have the same demand that it used to. So you didn't, just to follow up on that, you didn't mention policy. You sort of said there's only so many, so much, so much, so much steel and cement you need to build cities of a million people or more. And once you do that, it starts to plateau. Is that, that's been the primary driver more than concerns about air quality and, and policy? Yeah, I think, I mean, you've got other issues in terms of uh, like power sector, you know, the, you've got large amounts of renewables, nuclear, hydro coming online, which is largely driven by uh, the desire to reduce kind of air pollution in cities. Um, and with electricity uh, growth kind of slowing down in China, that just means a fixed pie. Um, and with a fixed pie, that means 
uh, some people will have to lose out, and in China that currently is coal producers. Um, and so there's uh, just fundamental market trends, uh, kind of environmental goals in China with air pollution, um, as well as new technologies coming on the coming on the scene. We haven't, let me turn it to you first, Jim, but others will comment on this too. We, ha we haven't said, maybe a little bit, we haven't really said nuclear yet. Can you talk about the role nuclear has played and will play moving forward? Well, I mean, I mentioned that nuclear is 59% of the carbon-free electricity in the United States today. So it plays a really dominant role, and it takes a heck of a lot of wind and solar to replace a 1,000-megawatt nuclear plant. So, I mean, I, I think if you're serious about climate, you have to be serious about making a place for nuclear in the equation. Uh, I think that's one of the flaws of, in the German policy is they're shutting down all their nuclear, and that's why they are, even though they've tripled the price for electricity for residential, they've seen their actual CO2 rise because they're having to turn to lignite coal because they shut down nuclear plants. And I think our great challenge going forward is being thoughtful about what's really the mission here. And I think the mission is moving to a low carbon world. And if that's the mission, then coal, I mean, nuclear can play a really important role there. And maybe the answer, given Westinghouse and some other problems about building new plants, is we extend the life of the existing plants from 60 to 80 years. And that buys time for new generations of nuclear to come online or other technologies that can operate at zero carbon. Anyone else? You want to comment on that? Yeah, let me. Um, uh, you know, so if you look at, I agree with Jim that, I mean, climate change is hard. Um, you know, despite the progress that we've made, uh, you know, we're still almost an order of magnitude. We're going almost an order of magnitude slower than we need to to meet two degrees, right? So over the past five years, the global energy supply has decarbonized by about half a percent a year, which is great. Significant improvement over what we did in the pre 10 years before that. To meet a two degree target, the global energy supply has to decarbonize by 2.8% a year every year for the next 35 years, right? So we're at half a percent a year. We need to get to 2.8% a year. And the electricity sector, where we spend all of our time thinking, is actually the easiest part of that equation, right? Like, nobody really, as a consumer, I don't care what makes the lights go on as long as they're on and reliable and affordable. We've got lots of different technology options. Uh, there's a question of cost and competitiveness. When you get outside of the electricity sector, it gets a lot harder, particularly like the industrial sector, which is 20% of emissions. Decarbonizing the industrial sector, we don't have a lot of great ideas on how to do that, in part because you need process heat. And this is one area where I think nuclear could be potentially very important is as a source of zero carbon heat for industrial processes that need heat. So when you kind of expand your scope of vision beyond what we need to do just in the power sector uh, to what we need to do to decarbonize the economy as a whole, suddenly things like advanced nuclear start to seem a lot more interesting. And then I agree with Jim's point on the existing fleet that, you know, to date, Almost every retirement that we have seen has been infilled with natural gas and emissions have increased. Uh, and, you know, and if there's a way to, like New York has done, reflect the social and economic value of that zero carbon generation in the market and it's still competitive to stay online, then that's a, then that's a good deal. You know, I'd add one thing. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the Paris Agreement, which we all applauded, if all the commitments were made there, it'd only be 43% of the reductions that are needed to get to two degrees. So that of it in itself was not enough. And so we need, but we had great hope with that, that from a bottoms up standpoint, we'd get increased commitments over time. So I think we need to recognize that we got to go way beyond Paris and we shouldn't, because in this conversation, we've almost embraced Paris as the goal line it's really the two degrees is the goal line, not the Paris commitments. So, and the takeaway from that is additional policies are needed. But just so people understand your view on the policies in place and that this executive order has said should be unwound, uh, the most significant being the Clean Power Plan. Um, people's view on whether the Clean Power Plan really matters, given where market trends are headed. That's something you hear different views about. So I'd be interested in maybe starting with you, Jim, and then yeah, Jeff and Trevor. I, I just have a point of view that... You know, maybe I kind of, I may have overstated it a little bit when I said the industry is headed to low carbon. I think directionally, yes, we are. 
but our industry for over 100 years has been driven by doing the most affordable thing. It turns out the gas was cheaper. New gas plants were more efficient in their conversion of a BTU to electricity. And so it was really an economic decision, maybe first and foremost, because you have to convince in the regulated states that you have a, this is the low cost option. And so what we did is go to regulators and say, that not only is this a low cost option, but we think we ought to replace our existing plants, our coal plants, even though they're fully depreciated. So I think there's, um, <clears throat> It's affordability, but it's also this long-term view about where policy's going. And that's why I am confident, maybe more than I should be, but I am really confident that we're gonna achieve the Clean Power Plan, even if it's eliminated. I'm not arguing that it should be eliminated, I don't think it should, but I do think I'm not gonna die on the hill for that if we maintain the direction we're headed. Jeff or Trevor, any, anyone disagree with that on sort of the importance of the, what, 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 the mar what things look like with or without the Clean Power Plan? No, I'm very much in agreement with that. Here's one, a quick point on nukes. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Um, there's a big, I mean, I think the big problem we face with nukes is that, as Jim emphasized, you know, they're half of our you know, clean power at the moment. Um, and most nukes in the US are reaching the end of their life. Um, they, you know, they say it could be relicensed for another 20 years, possibly in some cases, though we've already done that with quite a few of them. Um, and the big problem we face there is that the economics of new nuclear power stations at the moment is just incredibly unattractive. And we have an appalling track record of building nuclear power stations on budget and on time. And most nuclear power stations are massively over budget and massively over, over time. Um, and the economics is very unattractive. I mean, you can buy, you can get power from wind and solar for, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight cents a kilowatt hour, depending on where you are. Um, nuclear power seems to be coming in at around about 12 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour, given you know, what's happening with the southern companies building new structures, for example. Um, so just economically unattractive. Um, I think that it's a good idea to try to eke out the lives of the existing plants in the hope that we can come up with new nuclear technologies. And there are a lot of ideas out there uh, for you know, radically different nuclear reactors. The current generations of reactors were really essentially, in, the design was inspired by military considerations back in the 50s and 60s and the need to produce plutonium for weapons and things like that, that's totally irrelevant today. Um, and if you sort of, if you get rid of the constraints that you know, military thinking puts on uh, reactor design, you can come up with some much better designs than what <coughs> we've got. Um, but those are very expensive to prototype. You, know, you can prototype a, a new solar panel, you know, the guys in the engineering school here can prototype a new solar panel for a few million dollars. Uh, if you want to prototype a new nuclear reactor, you're talking hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. So it's a much more difficult area to make progress in, unfortunately. So I'm not, well, I think there are very good ideas out there. I'm not super optimistic that they'll be put into effect, I'm afraid. We did something where I think policy could be very important in that area. Also, Jim, I just was curious, your reaction to the comments uh, you heard um, about the outlook for the global coal market. I mean, we heard um, Pete talk about how it's, um, plateaued uh, in, in, in China, and then Trevor sort of say, yeah, there'll be growth in places like India, but that's just not, that's not of the magnitude that really, you know, provides an, a boost the way China did. Do you, do you agree with that? I do. I mean, uh, uh, China is kind of leads the world in solar panel production and wind turbine production. They're building 30 nuclear plants. Uh, they're really headed to reducing their carbon footprint and cleaning up their environment. So I'm confident of where they're going. So I think their use of coal has got to plateau and maybe decline over time. That would be my instinct. Just look at the numbers and talking to people in China. I mean, they're pretty excited. And both the Russians and the Chinese are using nuclear technology as part of their diplomacy. They go into these countries and say, we'll build you a new nuclear plant with our technology. So they see this not just for their own country, but they see it as an important arrow in their quiver for di diplomacy. We have a question uh, uh, from Twitter um, referencing a speech I, I was at that Secretary Perry gave in New York uh, yesterday. Um, uh, at which he said baseload power is a national security issue, and uh, this may be paraphrasing, but I, I heard him say something along the lines of the U.S. government would consider intervening in state policies to protect it. So the question, Jim, is for you. Do you think the federal government can or should intervene to make sure state power grids are stable? 
Well, first of all, the grids today deliver power 99.99% of the time. That's pretty daggone good. Um, and I really, you know, the primary responsibility across the country is it resides with the states to make sure the grids are working. There's only 19 states in the country that are in competitive markets. There's more states than that that are in RTOs. But the bottom line is, I think it makes sense. I've seen what's happened in, in PJM. I think it makes sense to have some subsidies to keep base load nuclear online. But I'm not sure it makes any sense to keep baseline coal online or even baseline gas, because I just have a different point of view about how you can, why it fits with public policy. But this notion that the federal government has somehow imposed some requirements on baseload generation, I think we ought to let the markets work. We ought to let the smart people in, R, in the RTOs and the ISOs around the country to make decisions about that. And I don't think that baseload is endangered, although, if you look at California with the amount of solar on the peak, you have uh, solar crushing solar, and the ramp rates as solar comes off on the peak, it's almost two or 3,000 megawatts that have to ramp really quickly to be able to maintain the stability of the system. And I know there's a great debate because there are some people that say we don't need any base load. I'm not in that camp, but I'm not sure our federal government should be dictating that. There is uh, anyone else on that? Right. Yeah, it sounds to me like an excuse for intervening and trying to roll back our renewable portfolio standards, quite frankly. <laughs> that was That's, how uh, some on Twitter <laughs> responded to it. Yeah, right. Um, um, as I, I think was that, uh, at the time. you know, there is, a, there is obviously a problem in managing large scale intermittent renewables, as you know, Jim was just emphasizing, the, you know, the, the, the ramp off and the ramp in are very steep. But I mean, I think the technology is coming down the line which can handle that. I mean, I think energy storage is going to be an important contribution there. Uh, you know, it isn't deployable on a really large scale yet economically, but within five to ten years, I think you'll be able to store large quantities of energy uh, in a ways that make it attractive to, to smooth out uh, output from renewables. You know, I agree with Jeff, and I, I would add just kind of an interesting way to think about this. On the grid today, we handle every second millions of random decisions of people turning lights on, turning them off, plugging in their cell phones, turning their toaster on, opening the refrigerator. We handle millions of demand side decisions every day and we integrate that into the grid and we handle the flow of electricity. We only have a few sources of power in the traditional model. My belief is we will write the software and handle interruptible, I mean, distributed generation as well as intermittent sources of generation. It's just about kind of developing the capability, get the software right to integrate that into the grid. I believe technically we can do it. We do it on the demand side. I think we'll do it on the supply side. Uh, there's also a question uh, from, from Twitter turning back to this, uh, the issue of uh, economic development in coal communities. And just to, to maybe say a little bit more, I know, Trevor, you teed that up, but question about sort of have people seen policies uh, working, what the outlook is, what do you think policymakers should do? Um, this is an issue we'll return to. We actually did invite several people from uh, Appalachia uh, and elsewhere to kind of come participate in this, and the timing didn't work, so we're going to turn back to that and probably organize a separate discussion to kind of delve more deeply into that with folks from those regions. But um, I know some of you have looked at this pretty closely. Maybe Maybe, uh, Jim, you want to offer a few thoughts and then, and then Trevor on sort of what, what you think policy should do in, with regard to economic development if, the, if this study is right and, and those jobs aren't, most of them, coming back. I think that, you know, I read J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly Elegy. I urge you all to read that. It kind of it resonated with me because I grew up in Kentucky but not in the coal country. The reality is, is a lot of those people don't want to move out of the mountains. They want to stay there as their families have been there. But that's just not the economic, there are no industries that you can, you're not going to have people that work in coal mines go build and install solar or build wind because they're, the wind doesn't blow in eastern Kentucky. <laughs> There's no solar. So, so they're going to have to 
migrate as all, uh, many of us have had to do. I mean, I don't, I've lived all over the country. And so I think there's going to be a different change. Yes, there's some short-term things we can do to help out economically. But at the end of the day, there's a recognition that that industry is dead. We need to move on. And I don't mean this in a callous way, but what, 75,000 people in the coal industry? Well, that's the number of people that work for Arby's. Okay? And so we, if we think about it in that way, it's an industry that is shrinking, dying. So people, we need to help make the transition but we ought to view it as a transition, not a long-term reinvestment. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic. Um, not much more, but a little bit more optimistic uh, about the prospects for diversification. And not because I think that there's, um, I think, you know, you generally view the world from, from the uh, uh, universe in which you operate. So, you know, if you're an energy person and you're like looking at a decline in coal production and Appalachia, and you're thinking about economic diversification, people generally go to, well, what could you do in terms of clean energy investment? And as Jim said, it's not clear that, you know, that, that, that that's the right industry for coal communities given their renewable resources. Though for some, I mean, Wyoming has the only class seven wind in the WEC. Uh, I think uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is dumping, you know, three billion in their current um, uh, IRP into Wyoming and renewables. Um, you've got a bunch of existing dams in Appalachia that don't have powerhouses. You could power those dams. That would take a lot of the same engineering talent that's, that's currently working in mining. Uh, but kind of a sustainable, long-term economic diversification strategy for coal communities, I think, is going to be primarily outside of the energy industry. And I, what gives me optimism is, so I, last Friday, I went and previewed the results of the study in, in southeast Wyoming and spent the weekend with my cousins who were there. And I left the state as a teenager. They stayed. That's why your slides at Columbia say University of Wyoming on the bottom? Oh, do they really? Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't change that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, Just when you didn't think they had a voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and they're, these guys are like, you know, they're 29. They're really committed to making the state a place that people want to stay, that young people want to stay, because we have, you know, our population in Wyoming is relatively constant, but that's because we swap young people for retirees on a pretty constant basis. And, uh, and we invest, you know, historically, thanks to the kind of wealth of, uh, of mineral production in the state, we invest a ton of money into our young people. We pay teachers twice as much as the national average. You can go to the University of Wyoming. I know New York State got a lot of, uh, that Cuomo got a lot of credit for being the first free tuition program, like Wyoming did that several years ago. Like if you're a Wyoming resident, you can go to the University of Wyoming for free, thanks to the Berkshire uh, Scholarship. Um, so we dump a ton of money into students, and then they all leave the state, right? I did. That's what I did. I left the state. And, uh, and so all of that investment is now accruing to the benefit of tax, uh, tax authorities in California rather than tax authorities in Wyoming. And, and the thing that gives me hope for the ability of this generation to make a future is that the traditional barriers that you mentioned, like if you're in Mingo County, if you're in Gillette, and you're thinking about attracting industry where you need to be geographically proximate to consumers, right? Or you need the ability of large infrastructure, or you need gigantic flat tracts of land. It's really hard to do that in a lot of central Appalachia, right? Because of the terrain, because of the infrastructure. What the growth of broadband technology is enabling is the ability for small companies to connect to customers despite those geographic <coughs> boundaries, right? So you have, I don't know, you know, when I was living in New York, a bunch of people in my generation all moved to Nashville because it was cheap and there was an art scene and they could like live there and do work the same there as anywhere else because they were in Nashville, uh, but the cost of living was like a quarter, right? Of the 25 employees that we have at Rhodium, probably a third work remotely in like Brevard, North Carolina, or Western Massachusetts, or wherever, right? Because it's really cheap to live there and it's beautiful. And, and I think that that allows the creation of culturally vibrant communities, leveraging that rich culture in the region. Like if you're, you know, in Whitesburg, Kentucky, you've got Apple Shop, which is this amazing, you know, cultural institution that harnesses all of that rich history of Appalachia in folk music and others. And it's like a really fun place to live if you're, uh, uh, if you're young and interested in folk music and bluegrass. And I think that that creating these vibrant centers around arts and culture that young people want to live in and create small businesses and use the internet to access markets. Now, that's not overnight going to replace a coal mine that employs a thousand people, right? But over time, I think that's going to be a more, uh, more sustainable strategy. 
strategy. And that's why I think it's such a tragedy that like in the current budget, the, you know, an administration that ostensibly cares a lot about these communities is axing funding for the NEA. Like that, you know, New York art scene is gonna be fine if the NEA budget gets cut. The Wyoming art scene is gonna get decimated if NEA budget gets cut, right? And uh, uh, the same for like the Power Plus initiative that was providing competitive grants to like innovative local entrepreneurs who are trying to create new small businesses in Appalachia. Um, so it takes patience and it takes focus. My big concern now, you know, the international coal market rally that Pete talked about, there's a little bit of a domestic coal market rally too. If you look at the Genscape data, which doesn't cover the whole universe of coal plants, but U.S. coal consumption in the power sector is up 7% year on year Q1, just because gas prices are a little bit higher because we had a cold January and we had a cold March, right? And I think Q1, when the employment data comes out, will be the first quarter in five years where coal employment has actually grown by a little bit, 100, 200 jobs maybe. And my concern is that like communities for whom this conversation is already really hard are gonna look at that as as, as, a, as evidence that there's a recovery coming, and it's gonna push off those more, those more challenging conversations. Yeah, well that's what, uh, so um, by the way, so I wanna open it up, so if folks have questions, there's a microphone here. If you could come stand at the microphone so folks online could hear you, that would be very helpful, if, 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 if you don't mind. Um, and I'll just say, I was asked by a reporter yesterday about this study, sort of what do you hope to accomplish with it? Uh, and you know, what I said was, it's, it's not a partisan thing, it's not trying to downplay what one administration did or criticize what another's doing, but, but hopefully if we can agree on a common set of facts and analysis and, 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 and be, be honest about what the outlook for coal is, then that allows across the aisle you to kind of shift and try to have a serious conversation about what to do about the fact that there's a lot of communities that, uh, that need a bit of help rebuilding their economies. But you know, over the last 20 years, people in eastern Kentucky, they've been shutting those coal mines down as it's moved from Central App Coal to Illinois Basin and to the surface mines in western Kentucky and Illinois. So that's, that has been occurring. Mm -hmm. And I, I would dare say, and I haven't seen the analysis, but I'm not sure a lot is left mm -hmm. in a lot of those counties. Uh, maybe smaller mines, but not many. Uh, so folks could briefly uh, identify themselves and uh, ask questions, that'd be helpful, thank you. Hi, my name is Frank Convery. I'm the Chief Economist at the Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you very much, enjoyed this session enormously. I'm delighted to see the focus on the alternative diversity options in these communities. I think that's a great add-on to the discussion. Um, my question really is for Jim, is the, the, I think we would agree in the Environmental Defense Fund that the, the lock-in of gas is a potential issue in terms of meeting what we have to do. Um, and I just wonder what you would recommend both in terms of business strategy, but especially on the policy side, to manage that issue? No, that's a really good question. As you know, I'm a little concerned about where's the right place to intervene. In the states that are regulated, and the majority still are, they still do integrated resource plans, and there's an opportunity there to kind of look at the projected mix over the next 20 years and start to see where the lock-in occurs. So, you, so there's a way to do analysis to intervene and play a role in making, in making sure they address that issue. Forward-looking, addressing the issue, not looking back. In the competitive markets, is not as clear. The competitive markets historically in the United States have had far more gas plants than in the regulated markets. And so I think, you take California, that's kind of the best example, or New York, only about 2% of the electricity comes from coal plants. So the shift to gas hadn't happened there, and won't happen there, because it didn't that much capacity. The big question is, is that do you replace existing old gas plants that are inefficient with new gas plants? I think that becomes the issue in competitive markets, and I think it makes sense at some level economically because of the efficiency improvement, but it still locks in a whole longer generation to gas. So it's a, I don't have an answer for competitive markets. Okay, thank you very Can much. I, I mean, a carbon tax would be an obvious comment <laughs> in that context, right? Yeah. I mean, a carbon tax would raise, you know, a significant carbon tax would raise the cost of power from gas by a couple of cents a kilowatt hour. Just while you're on there, Jeff, could you dwell on the storage issue? I know you're 
invested heavily in that area? Um, the storage issue is, is not an easy one to, to summarize. I mean, the point is that a natural way of dealing with the intermittency of renewable energy output is to put some of the output into storage. Uh, and then basically use storage devices as a way of smoothing uh, an intermittent output. Um, that's been feasible but completely uneconomic until recently. Uh, you know, as much as a, as recently as a couple of years ago, cost you know, batteries that could store energy on a large scale were costing $400 a kilowatt hour of capacity. Um, <clears throat> today you can get batteries that will store a lot of power for $150 a kilowatt hour of capacity. Um, and forecasts are that it will go down to $100 a kilowatt hour. Uh, within the next few years. There are also some radically new technologies for storing energy on the horizon as well. Um, so, you know, if you get a significant reduction in the cost of energy storage, it will become not just technically but economically feasible to smooth out the output of renewables by just taking a fraction of that output when it's available, putting it into storage, and just using that as a, an energy source when there's no renewable energy available. Um, you can also smooth out the output to some degree by spatial diversification. You know, the correlation between wind output in, say, the northeast and the southwest is, is far from one. So there's a good chance that wind is blowing in one region when it's not blowing in another region. And if you have a more in effectively integrated grid than we do, you can smooth out outputs by that kind of spatial diversification as well. Um, and there have been a, quite a few studies of <coughs> scope for doing both of these things. And they suggest that you, know, you can actually handle very high levels of penetration of renewables without overly stressing the grid if you invest sufficient in these, these sources. And at the moment, we're basically using gas plants for this. You know, if you have a sudden drop in output of solar power in California, then you ramp up some gas plants. And gas plants are playing a very important role in facilitating the integration of renewables into the, into the grid, actually. You know, North Carolina is unique in a way, although there's other places in the country. They have 1,700 megawatts of pumped hydro. So they pump it up at night and use it during peak periods during the day. Could, it works really well with their nuclear fleet that runs 24-7. Next question. Thanks for waiting. Hi. No problem. Um, my name is Dan Flatley. I'm a student here at the Journalism School, and I'm also a West Virginia native. Uh, I was recently in Madisonville, Kentucky, uh, speaking with some miners who were caught up in some of the bankruptcies that we've seen over the last few years. And uh, on Capitol Hill right now, there are a few proposals to sort of extend health coverage for, for these folks. Um, and maybe pensions as well, although that's uh, kind of a contentious issue. And I think I had seen in your report that you had addressed a little bit of, you know, what needs to be done in, in sort of, or some suggestions as to what could be done in, in these kinds of situations. So I was just wondering if you could uh, speak about that a little bit. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, there, um, there was an agreement in the 40s between the federal government and the United Mine Workers. Uh, around a very large mine strike uh, to uh, socialize some of the pension obligations uh, of, uh, of the United Mine Workers uh, and to create a multi-employer fund uh, that, uh, that companies paid into for retirees. Um, the bankruptcies that have occurred over the past few years have limited the payments going into that multi-employer fund and a number of the companies that have filed for bankruptcy have tried to use bankruptcy courts to get out of their obligations to retired miners while paying executives tens of millions of dollars in bonuses. Um, and uh, as a result, there are you know 120,000 retired miners and dependents who risk losing both their uh, pensions and their health care uh, if a federal backstop isn't put in place. Uh, so there's a bill called the Miners Protection Act that uh, authored by Senator Manchin from West Virginia uh, that has been around for a few years now. Uh, the current Senate Majority Leader uh, was blocking it from getting a vote for a long time. Uh, finally agreed to give it an extension uh, to uh, vote for a stopgap extension last year that, you know, that runs out pretty soon. Uh, and uh, so the question now before the Congress is whether they're, uh, uh, whether they're willing to step up. It matters not just to those retirees and dependents, but it's a major source of uh, those pension payments and the health care payments are a major source of economic activity in the communities where those uh, where those retirees uh, uh, live, and uh, you know I think it's these are folks who like 
put their health and their lives on the line to deliver affordable and reliable power to the rest of us for you know for uh, half a century and uh, you know the least we can do is make sure that like the benefits that they were promised over that period of time are actually uh, uh, are actually delivered next question uh, my name is Kirsten Feldman I'm a trustee of environmental defense fund I was actually in um, Pinedale, Wyoming, week before last, I learned more about gas than I did about coal. But I wanted to ask about clean coal. So uh, I saw a recent interview that Secretary Pruitt did where he said how the coal has gotten much cleaner, cleaner than it's ever been, and there's an opportunity to export our clean coal to China to replace their dirty coal. And so I wanted to ask if that's a thing, <laughs> really a thing. You want to start? Want to you, start. Were pretty, you were pretty bearish on CCS. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, I, I invested. And maybe you went just like the question of is clean coal a thing, just, you know, the distinction between CCS and, and the other sure. pollutants from coal. Right. Yeah, clean coal is, <laughs> the better term is cleaner coal um, first. And, and, and then the second point is to make it cleaner coal, you need CCS. And I've worked, I've had partnerships with the Chinese looking at this. There's been huge efforts made by DOE. Um, efforts, I've done a lot of projects with DOE and trying to look at how you can do sequestration. And I guess at the end of the day, no one has figured out how to develop the technology that's cost effective. It's extremely expensive. And I think it, you, and, and you wouldn't export it anyway uh, because you would do the carbon capture at the power plant, not at the mine. It's just kind of the way it works. And we even built a coal gasification facility in Indiana and was designed to be able to do carbon capture on the front end. We had fairly large cost overruns to build it, but it cr turned coal into gas. And so it's cheap to take it out on, cheaper to take it out on the front end versus the, the back end of a plant, the flue gas end. And so my judgment is, and I'd love to hear what Trevor says, because he probably knows all the details better than me, but I believe that it's just too expensive today. There's been no breakthroughs. There's been a lot of money invested to figure it out. And the, the idea that we would export cleaner coal is just wrong. We might export the technology, but it wouldn't be cleaner on the barges going to the other country. And, and, yeah. Oh, the coal's unchanged. Right. It's just to be clear, you're talking about technology to remove CO2 emissions CO from coal, and, and there is technology that can remove local air pollutants, and we've done that for a long time. So they're that's, different. Yeah, but that's, I mean, you know, this, the power sector spent all the money to clean up coal, not the coal industry. You'd think they'd spend a lot of money invested to clean up their product. They haven't done that. So at the end of the day, when we burn it, we take out the SO2, we take out the NOx, we take out fine particulate, PM2, I mean, we take all that out. But it's done at the plant, so you can't clean it up here and then send it. You gotta clean it up where you burn it. So one, I mean, Trevor, the follow-up question I have for you, and then also we have like one of the world's leading experts on carbon capture and storage, Alyssa Park, in the room. So maybe she'll come and comment on that at the microphone too, uh, professor in the uh, uh, here at Columbia. Um, you know, Jeff is saying, um, uh, sorry, Jim is saying that, uh, that that the economics of CCS don't work, and and I guess one question is also when we think about not today, but the cost curve to, of, of abatement to get to two degrees. Yeah. And when you start to think about the kinds of things that will have to happen to get us there, you know, do, do we, do, what, what do you see as the outlook for CCS? Yeah, so I, so I think like the distinction that Jim was making is important between, you know, clean coal as in reducing like criteria pollutants. And so what are the technologies that need to be put in place to generate coal without mercury and other air toxics? And as Jim said, there are technologies to do that. They don't remove it from the coal, they remove it at the end of the flue pipe, generally. Um, and, uh, but when it comes to CO2, so then that's carbon capture and sequestration. I think if you're just looking within the power sector, the economics of CCS are challenging right now because we have 
you know, because of the cost declines in renewables and other low carbon sources. Um, there are some interesting technologies. Uh, Net Power has a, a pilot plant they're building in Texas. It's actually gas CCS. So there's some interesting innovations happening in the CCS space, um, more on the gas side than on the coal side. Uh, to me, where the kind of opportunity for CCS is ripest is again in that we gotta like broaden our spectrum outside of the like narrow electricity sector to the industrial sector where if I'm trying to think about how to produce steel or cement, zero carbon, you know, and I need process heat uh, and I have emissions that come from the current combustion of that process heat, I can do a couple things. I could replace it with a high temperature nuclear reactor to generate all the heat. I could do electrically produced heat, which is pretty inefficient and expensive, or I could use, put in place CCS on that industrial facility. And this gets to your point about the cost curve. Like when you're in the industrial sector where the option set is much more limited, it may be true that uh, CCS is gonna be a more competitive option. And the third thing I would say is, if you're of the view that over the long term, we're going to need to be at zero or net negative emissions, we need to actually be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, then one of the ways to do that is you generate electricity using biomass, and then you sequester the emissions from the biomass. Um, there are a bunch of challenges around land use management and deforestation. There's a bunch of questions around that. But certainly, like, the models that globally that can still solve for two degrees do so through extraordinarily large-scale biomass CCS, right? It may prove that that's not viable and or a bad idea, but there is assumption built into, you know, the kind of still viable pathways for two degrees in which CCS pre plays a pretty heavy role. Um, so we'll, we won't put a list on the spot. I'll just note that in our Global Energy Summit a uh, week before last, I think, uh, we had a whole panel uh, focused on uh, the outlook for CCS uh, that Alyssa was on, along with another professor, Peter Kellerman, Julio Friedman from Lawrence Berkeley, uh, and the Chief Technology Officer of Saudi Aramco, and that's on our website. So people who want to learn more about CCS, uh, I would recommend watching that. Um, we have time, I think, for the last two questions. Maybe we'll take them both together and give people a chance to answer. Uh, Nathan Wendt, Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs. I was also going to ask a question about the outlook of CCS, so pivoting a little bit. Um, looking at uh, coal communities, Wyoming, Appalachia, and beyond, are there some good models there that these communities could look to, replicate potentially, or is it really more kind of a just sort of open ex time for experimentation and, and, and just see what works? Agreed. Was that, you have a question as well? Was it? Okay. Well, but, um, we have last question. Um, on the note of what's happening with coal communities in China and trying to find uh, places for these workers, um, a lot of solutions there kind of look similar to here where it's, you know, the state of policy will rely on entrepreneurialism. We're going to get these workers into, you know, <coughs> things like Didi Chu, which is like the equivalent of Uber or Lyft. Um, that one stat said like about a million iron and steel workers uh, who used to work in iron and steel are now driving for DD2. And, you know, it's whether that's a long term solution or not um, is yet to be determined, but, you know, it's similar thought process and similar experimentation to what's going on over here. I don't know if there's a model in Appalachia. I do know that <laughs> this is imperfect, but for the last 30 years, as the coal mines winded down in eastern Kentucky, people didn't want to leave their land. They didn't want to leave their way of life. They wanted to stay with their families. So you'd look at Interstate 75 coming out of the mountains, going to Cincinnati, into Ohio and Chicago, and you see carloads of men on Sunday night driving to a factory someplace in Ohio staying in a, a, a one-room apartment with four guys sleeping in sleeping bags and getting in the car on Friday night and driving back to the mountains. That's the way it's been handled for 30 years for people that didn't want to leave the mountains and felt a kinship to the mountains. Now, there's not been any specific, and, and there's little cottage industries that have grown up in the mountains, but at the end of the day, You've had that occur, but you've also had this great outflow of people from the mountains to Lexington and to Louisville and to Cincinnati and to other cities around the country. So there's been an out-migration coupled with this work in Ohio during the week and come home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the challenge is, you know, even within coal communities, they're heterogeneous, right? So, like, what your option set is if you're in, you know, Gillette is much different than what your option set looks like if you're in eastern Kentucky or southern West Virginia. And so I think the, you know, the most important thing is not looking for silver bullets, that there's, like, one industry that's going to come in and replace the coal industry. And I think ultimately it's about, like, empowering local entrepreneurs to, um, and young people in particular, like you've got to empower the folks who have a vested interest in a multi-decadal future for their community, not the folks who are just trying to stop gap the last five years of their career, because their interests are just going to be very different. And uh, and and I think that there's, you know, there are some some models that I've seen that are kind of successful in bringing a community together for an integrated strategy is the Sustainable Williamson Initiative in Mingo County, which is a community health center that has created an incubator for small businesses, is working with the local economic development authority to repurpose abandoned mine land for manufacturing, identified a bunch of public health issues because it's a health center that they're finding local economic development solutions for. So they're using locally sourced agriculture for the school food system. Uh, and that kind of integrated thinking where you get stakeholders in a community around the table who can s look at what the challenges are, think about what their assets are, and develop a strategy together is going to work much better than, you know, a kind of template white paper written by really smart think tank guys, <laughs> you know, about, uh, about what's going to work in each of these, each of these communities. So if I could um, thank you all for being here. Thanks for your questions. If I could maybe summarize a few takeaways from, from what I heard. Um, that uh, the answer to the question that, uh, the, the, that was the title of the paper, coal is not coming back to its heyday uh, of what it once was in the U.S., which has been driven by automation, mechanization, lots of market forces. Importantly, an important insight is what happened in the international market in particular and how the collapse of Chinese coal lowered coal prices and what impact that had on U.S. firms. Um, that... Uh, the many the, the 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 elements of the executive order which would roll back many of Obama's uh, rules would maybe stabilize coal instead of a continued decline unless gas remains cheaper than is currently projected unless renewables continue to fall at the rate they have been in which case uh, those policies would make less uh, of an impact uh, the takeaway from that is the need to be honest about the challenges a lot of these communities face and focus on developing policies that help to rebuild the economies there and diversify them. Um, but all of that doesn't necessarily mean that some people then make that leap. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that coal is dead or that the low uh, clean energy transition and a transition away from coal happens all by itself moving forward, certainly not consistent to get anywhere close to two degrees without additional policy. And and so the, the focus on policy is still important. Is that, uh, well I, any, any, did I miss, in, 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 characterize anything inaccurately? Um, okay, well, uh, it, as I said, Trevor and Pete, it was great to collaborate on this project. It's always uh, fun to get a chance to, to, to work with you and, and always learn an enormous amount, so I'm glad we could do that. Um, Jeff, thanks for joining us to talk today, and Jim, thank you for traveling to New York to be with us today. Um, thanks to all of you. I will mention one of the things that is an important uh, f factor in everything we just talked about is what the outlook for renewables is, and our next event at the Energy Center uh, will be on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in Faculty House here on campus to talk about the renewable energy outlook for New York uh, State in particular with the head uh, the president of Statoil Wind, which just won the largest ever uh, offshore uh, offshore wind contract uh, from the from the U.S. government. Dan Esty, who's known to many of you from Yale University, Richard Kaufman, also known to many of you, uh, responsible for energy here for Governor Cuomo, Eric Martel, the president and CEO of Hydro-Quebec, and then our own Professor Vijay Modi, who's done a lot of work modeling the integration of renewables into the New York State uh, electricity grid. So I hope you'll join for that. Please join me in thanking our panel.